Good morning. I want to welcome each of you to Hill Country Bible Church, those joining us online or at Steiner Ranch or any of our venues. We're so grateful to be together. And I'm curious, have you ever seen in the image something that happened maybe that actually you can't get it out of your mind? Like it's indelibly planted in your head? It's so amazing or so awful that like it's stuck there? Now, now, for some of us, it, it may be something wonderful. Like, how many would ever forget the image of seeing their firstborn child? You know, that moment in time when a man becomes a father or a woman becomes a mother? I'll never forget seeing that slimy little form <laughs> of my daughter. It's indelibly planted in my mind as one of the greatest moments ever. September 4th, 1987, Lincoln uh, General Hospital in Ruston, Louisiana, boom, it's there, okay? Now, some of those memories, though, are the opposite of that. I was actually in the Lakeline worship suite when somebody yelled, uh, a plane just flew into one of the Twin Towers in New York City. I ran into an office, turned on a television set, just when the second plane came into that tower and just exploded in a ball of flames as that jet fuel just blew up in that building. Now that's an image that I'll never get out of my mind as long as I live. And many of you saw that same image and it stuck there. It made an impression. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there is one image that when you see it, you'll never unsee it. It will be permanently placed, etched in your mind for all eternity. And that's the cross of Jesus Christ. In fact, a disciple cannot unsee the cross. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're following him, the cross never leaves your focus. Now, we, we've been in an interesting sermon series over the last several months. We, we actually started in John chapter 13, which took place on Thursday night of the Passion Week. So on Thursday night, Jesus with his disciples go to the upper room where they eat the Passover. It's there that Jesus tells them, as he picks up the third cup of the Passover meal, the cup of redemption, and pauses in the meal and he says, breaking the bread, this is my body which is given for you, and then passes the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the communion that we to this day practice happened on that night. Jesus went on over the next couple hours to explain to them how to live in a world that will be a world filled with opposition, persecution, challenges, because he's going to the cross and he wants them to thrive in his absence. And so we looked at the last words of Jesus that he spoke before he went to the cross. And then shortly after that, Jesus will leave the upper room, be arrested, be tried, be crucified, be buried, ultimately rise from the dead. And that's what John talks about in chapters 18 through chapter 21. And we're following that story. And as we follow that story, we're actually focused on, is it finished? Now, some of you would say, well, Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, and that's true that his part is finished, but he also has a part for you to play and a part for me to play. And so the work of Jesus has been passed on to us. And so in chapters 18 through 20, Jesus is showing us how to live out his last acts. How do I live out his last acts? Now people say to me all the time, <clears throat> when Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And people ask me all the time, what does that mean to take up your cross? Like in our culture today, how would a person take up his cross? And I think it's such an interesting and maybe obvious question. Because Jesus said that and then he showed us how to do it. 
So the best way to understand what it looks like for you and I to carry our cross in life is to actually look at what Jesus did, his love, his sacrifice, his willing to endure hardships for the greater good. That's what Jesus means when he calls us into this glorious mission to follow him. Now last week we started with his arrest. He leaves the upper room with his disciples. Jesus is arrested. He's, they drag him off through a series of trials. And what we learned from our teaching last week is that a disciple lives by the truth. A disciple actually lives by the truth. In other words, Jesus didn't compromise the truth in order to get off. Jesus didn't try to argue his way out of trouble. Jesus just stated the truth, lived in the truth no matter what. Whether it's hard, whether people reject you, whether you lose something along the way, People who follow Jesus live by the truth. They they live by the truth. Now today, we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus. And as we dive in and look at the crucifixion of Jesus, so grab your Bibles and open them to John chapter 19. I just want to warn you, okay? I'll just warn you right off the bat. So John is an eyewitness, and he's writing what he sees, And the intensity of the scenes that we're going to be looking at today are hard to stomach. And once you truly see these and you understand the implications for you personally, you cannot unsee them. They will be permanently, indelibly etched in your mind. You'll have them there permanently. You'll have them there permanently. First of all, John shows us. Now, this is, he's an eyewitness. He's there watching. John shows us the suffering and love of Jesus. Starting in verse 16b, we read, the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. So Jesus now has been all night having trials, Going through the accusations, the false accusations, in the process of that, they're physically beating him. They're punching him in the face. He gets to Pilate's judgment hall, and they really humiliate him. They make a crown of thorns, cram it on his head, put a robe on him, begin to punch him, ask him to prophesy. And while they're beating him, Pilate is interacting with the Jewish leadership at the time. And finally, what Pilate does is he surrenders him to be crucified. And the first thing that happens then is they strip him and they whip him. Now, the beatings that took place in those days before a crucifixion were the type that would literally tear the flesh off your back. The probability is that Jesus' bones are now exposed from the beating, and the next thing they do from the judgment hall is make Jesus carry the cross beam of the cross, that heavy, probably 50, 60 pound piece of wood of which he's going to be nailed to. He has to now carry it from the judgment hall through the city, outside the city gates, up the hill of Golgotha, where he's going to be crucified, and there the crucifixion happens. So that's what's happening to Jesus. And notice in verse 18, it says, Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Now, what's so interesting is that John simply states there they crucified him and doesn't explain crucifixion. Why does John not go into detail as to what happens in a crucifixion? Because John knew that every one of his readers knew exactly what a crucifixion was. In fact, crucifixion was such a horrible, horrible thing that you didn't actually speak the words in polite company. People didn't use those words. Crucifixion was actually used by the Roman Empire, and by the way, it has a long history of use, but Rome perfected it. And the purpose of crucifixion was to say to everybody, you don't ever want this to happen to you. It was an attempt to create such an awful picture in the minds of people that they would never rebel. 
And that's why crucifixion was primarily in the Roman world used for slaves. I mean, when you think about half the population of the Roman world was slaves, how do you keep that half from overcoming the other half? You crucify a lot of them. Reserved for slaves and insurrectionist. Every once in a while they'd throw another criminal in there, but it wasn't a common punishment. Now when it comes to crucifixion and what actually happens during crucifixion, you almost have to take out of your mind the idea of execution. Because in our world today, when we think about execution, we think about the goal is, is to take someone's life like hang them until they're dead or shoot them with a firing squad or drop a, some, some cyanide in there and, and let them die in a gas chamber. We, we don't think of anything prolonged. In fact, in our world today, we think of how do we make this as painless as possible? But this was more torture that leads to death rather than a death sentence. In other words, the goal of crucifixion was maximum pain, maximum torture on a hill outside the city, stripped naked with the goal of so humiliating the person that the rest of us would say, that could never happen to me. Tell me where to get in line. I'll do whatever you say. So what is crucifixion? Essentially, what the Romans perfected it to be is a form of torture. And what they would do is they would take a person, lay them on the cross beam, and they would drive a nail through the wrist just below the hands so it caught on the nerve there. And they would make sure the hands weren't stretched too far because movement was one of the most important things to create the maximum suffering. So they would have the arms bent... And then they would take the feet, they would lap one over the top and drive a nail through the arches of the heel into the wood below and raise the person up on the cross so their body weight is now suspended between their hands and their feet, between the nails in their hands and the nails in their feet. Now, the crucifixions weren't all universal. Some people improvised. We actually have some archaeological evidence that for some people, they put their feet on each side of the crossbar and then nailed them in from the sides. But the point was still the same, that you're suspended by your arms with your feet providing the base. And both of those are injured in a way that pain is your life. Now, what would happen is, as you began to sink down on your feet, as your arms fatigued and your shoulders became fatigued in this process, what you would immediately begin to realize is that it was impossible to breathe. The amount of pressure on your chest and the position that they had you in would make it easy to inhale but difficult to exhale. And so in order to breathe, you had to push with your legs and pull with your arms up to be able to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. And so they actually put the prisoner in a position where unless they moved, they would soon become asphyxiated. And the fear of asphyxiation is a tremendously difficult fear. We know that from the modern day practice that some do of waterboarding. When you can't breathe, the panic is profound. But in order to breathe, the pain was intense. And so for hours on end, the person that was crucified would spend their time putting pain on their arms as they pulled themselves up, breathe, but after a while, the, the muscle cramps, the difficulty, the fatigue would allow them, they'd sink back down, their legs would get it as well, muscle cramps, spasms going through that, and every time they pulled up and every time they went back down, the back that had been ripped to shreds by the, the, the executioner's whip just re- rode up and down on that wooden cross beam in the back and just continued to do damage. Over time, through pain, through fatigue, through muscle cramps, spasms, the heart and the lungs began to be compromised. The the serum that used to be blood began to pool around the heart, and all of a sudden this deep chest pain, a heart attack feeling pain began to set in. And at that point, the victim was close to death. And at some point in time, They couldn't continue, and that was the end. 
All that is stated in the one phrase, they crucified him. That's what Jesus endured on the cross. Jesus suffered intensely. And when you truly see Jesus on the cross suffering, that's a scene that you cannot unsee. That's forever in your mind. You say, well, how in the world could anybody do that to another person? I want you to watch how callous the religious leaders and the political leaders and even the soldiers were at the cross. Look at what we read in verse 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The the sentence was always there because this was public scorning, public humiliation. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Always crucified on the pathway, the road outside the city, so everybody could see. And the chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews. But this man claimed to be king of the Jews. They're arguing over what's on the sign, not the suffering of the Savior. And Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shears, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot. Let's roll the dice, see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, you might want to underline that in your Bible. Scripture might be fulfilled. We'll come back to it in just a few minutes, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Now, for many people... We can't even imagine because we do not experience this stuff. And yet, we should, right? How many of you were in horror over the weekend to find out that when the Russian military was pulling back, they were leaving minefields behind in these towns and actually even wiring explosives to the dead bodies so that when the soldiers and the civilians came back to their homes, that they could get blown up in that. And you think to yourself, how in the world does that happen? We so easily forget That in our lifetimes, for many people, World War II, 25 million people died on the planet, people killing each other, and actually that's been the history of humanity, but we are so isolated from that, we, we just can't, like, it's hard for us to get our minds around it. So how is it that it's different today? I love what the historian Um, Garrett Fagan writes uh, about the history of Rome and what what life was like in Rome in Jesus' day. He said, the ideas of universal human dignity were almost all but non-existent. In large swaths of the population were seen as inherently worthless. Now, what does he mean by universal human dignity? That everybody has a right to life, that everybody should live, that everybody has dignity? In other words, massive groups of the population in the Roman Empire were considered unworthy of life, as if they don't exist as a human being. He goes on to say, weak members of society were objects not of compassion, but of derision, More than most, Romans lionized strength over weakness, victory over defeat, dominion over obedience. Losers paid a harsh price and got what they deserved, and resistors were to be ruthlessly handled. Roman politics became a ruthless game of total winners and abject losers. The drive to dominate and not be forced to bow before arrival was paramount. In other words, the idea that two teams would shake hands after a contest, like last night on the basketball floor, that was non-existent. You mocked the losers. You looked down on the losers. You mistreated the losers. So what changed? 
Do you realize how important Jesus Christ is to history? For you see, nobody even thought twice about crucifixion until Jesus was crucified and people started worshiping the God who died on a cross? You're kidding me. He's got to be a loser. But they worshiped him. And when Constantine came to faith, the Roman Empire Emperor Constantine, he outlawed crucifixion in honor of Jesus. That's why it doesn't happen anymore. Our idea is not that. In addition to that, they worshiped a God who died like a slave. Slavery was normal all over the planet. Every civilization throughout history embraced slavery. Until the church, honoring Jesus, began to work to rid it. Jesus Christ is the reason why we don't have crucifixion and slavery today. He's made a difference in the world. And the reason why is not simply because he suffered, but the reason why he suffered, he suffered out of love for his people. There's another group at the cross, and we see them... In verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. I I, I want you to get this for a moment. Can you imagine knowing that your son or your child was crucified? As a mother, can you imagine that? How much more as a mother think about being there and watching it happen. The only thing worse than being there for Mary was not being there. And having to watch Jesus, her son, die alone. And so the women came and endured the pain of their love being destroyed on the cross. And they watched. But they were not the only one there. And Jesus, in the midst of his pain, noticed them and responded. Notice what we read. He said, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved. Now the disciple whom he loved is John's nickname that he calls himself in the Gospel of John. In other words, John was actually there with the four women. The only disciple that hung around, the rest of them fled in fear. John is standing there, and Jesus, through his pain, as the blood and the sweat came down over his face, fogged his vision, Jesus sees through the vision, sees through his own suffering, and in that moment, he actually says to John and his mother, he he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son, and to to the disciple, here is your mother, and from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. In other words, Jesus actually cared. He cared enough to make sure his mother was loved and taken care of, that John would now be her protector and that she would have somebody because he's gone and he can no longer protect her. That's love displayed here. But the writers of the New Testament go on and say something really profound. They say that Jesus died not just for his mother, but for you and me. That from the cross, Jesus actually was thinking about us. That Jesus knew us, and that Jesus was suffering on our behalf. That's how much he loves you. And when you finally see that, that Jesus would give up his life and suffer that kind of death just for me because he loves me, You can't unsee that. You can't unsee that. The second thing that John really wants us to see on the cross is the sacrifice and death of Jesus. Not only his suffering and his love, but also the sacrifice that he was actually making and then his death. Notice what he says in verse 25, verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed, so six hours of the suffering the darkness over the world for three hours. It says later, at that time, knowing that all was now completed. What is completed, Jesus? The sacrifice for sin. He knows that. 
so that the scripture would be fulfilled. You might want to underline that scripture be fulfilled. We're going to come back to it in a minute. Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now, this is an ironic statement. Now, we understand why, in his human nature, why he would say, I am thirsty, because the excruciating dehydration that takes place in that suffering on the cross is overwhelming. And so we know why he would say that as a human. But what's so interesting is when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying to the Father, he says, Father, if it's possible, can this cup of wrath pass from me? Can I not have to drink the cup of wrath? And the Father said, no, it's not possible. You have to drink the cup of wrath and you have to drink it alone. And so Jesus has drunk the full cup of God's wrath and now he says, I am thirsty. The living water is dry. The living water is dying. Jesus has given his full self to pay for the sacrifice of all the sins. And he's reached a point where he acknowledges that. I'm spent on your behalf. Well, people are standing around. Here the I am thirsty in verse 29. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it in a sponge, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, which hyssop was used in the sprinkling of the blood in the tabernacle, and lifted it to Jesus. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. To Telestai. The word that means complete, there's nothing to be added, it's all done. What is finished? Jesus is finished paying for all of the sins of the world, and with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Once Jesus had paid for every single sin that every single one of us have committed, every evil thought, word, deed, every selfish, prideful act, Jesus paid for all of those. Then, and only then, he died. Now, I know for a lot of people, I, I hear the, this objection. Well, like, why would God make his son suffer for me? Like, in order for God to forgive me, all he has to do is just say it. Like, I forgive you. It's kind of like forgive and forget. And a lot of people think that. You know, why wouldn't God just forgive and forget? Well, first of all, it... it implies that we believe that this world is not real. That the things we do to each other and to ourselves don't matter to God. Like, it's just a fairy tale. And so, therefore, like, God, just forget it. What we're actually saying is, God, just forget me. That my life is meaningless. In addition to that, if you actually live in a real world, you know that when somebody does something that damages another person or another thing, that if you forgive, you actually now have taken on your responsibility to pay the price to fix it. Let me illustrate. Suppose somebody steals your car. Right? They steal your car, they wreck it, they get caught. And you say, well, I can either hold them accountable to pay to fix my car because even though I've got it back, it doesn't work anymore. Or you can say, I forgive you, which means what? Now you have to bear the cost to fix the car or it isn't put back right. Now I know some of the cynics in the room and online, you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's not a good illustration. I've got insurance. <laughs> caught you, right? I caught you. Just watch as your premium goes up. You will pay for that. <laughs> Smart, right? So here's God's dilemma. Let's just, let's just, now let's apply this to God. Here's God's dilemma. God gave you life. You belong to him. God gave you life. You belong to him. You didn't create yourself. You're here because of him. And what does he demand of you? That you live out his love in everything you do. Because you were created in the image of God and given the ability to actually do the will of God in the world. 
But the reality is none of us do that. We do our own thing, and along the way we create damage both in our own selves and in the people around us. So now this damage has been created. So what is God going to do? Now, God could say, listen, it's on you, people. You've created the damage. You're going to get the judgment. You're going to pay for what you did. I'll hold you all accountable. And if that were the case, none of us would have a prayer of entering into God's kingdom and standing in his presence like we've all messed up. Or God could say, listen, I'm going to forgive you by putting things right. I will be the one who takes your punishment. I will be the one who suffers in your place. I will be the one who bears the offenses. And having done that now, I can be a just God to offer you forgiveness if that's what you desire. You see, what you do actually matters to God. And God is going to make it right by taking your punishment on himself. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And so now you have the opportunity to say, Jesus, thank you. Jesus, you did this for me? Everything you did there, you were suffering on my behalf. That's how much you love me? I want that love in my life. The sacrifice. But not only the sacrifice, John wants you to see that Jesus really died because there have been a lot of fables and stories made up about, well, Jesus didn't really die and they took him down and he revived himself and all that. Watch what John actually reports here. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be the spe a special Sabbath, so we know it took place on Friday, because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Now, why break the legs? So they wouldn't have the stability anymore to get themselves back up to breathe. In other words, it would speed up the asphyxiation and cause them to die faster. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, for those of you who understand what's taking place medically here, by doing that, putting a spear through him, they punctured the lungs and the heart. That would produce the blood and water. This is actually a kill shot. If they didn't detect any breathing and they thought he was still alive, this would definitely have taken him out. And in verse 35, the man who saw it, John's talking about himself and has given testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and testifies so that you may believe these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled again another time. Not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture says they will look on the one they have pierced. Now I want us to pause for just a second, and I want to show you some things. In John's account right here, in these six hours, John points to four specific Old Testament prophecies that were prophesied about the coming Messiah, some of them 900 years before Jesus came, up to 500 years before Jesus came, and I want you to see how the details were prophesied in advance. So here are just four. What did they do to Jesus' clothes? In Psalm 22, 900 plus years before Jesus, the psalmist writes about the Messiah, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. How would he know that 900 years before? When it comes to Jesus being thirsty, the psalmist writes, my strength is dried up like a pot sheared, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Second prophecy, here's the third one. Jesus' bones not being broken. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Psalm 34, 20, around eight to 900 years before Jesus, 
was actually on the cross. And one final one, Jesus' side pierced. Zechariah writes, talking about the people looking back on their Messiah, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Four prophecies fulfilled in six hours. I want you to know that there are about a hundred prophecies in the Old Testament that are specifically fulfilled in the life of Jesus himself. Now, I just want you to know, if you're you're a little bit skeptical and you kind of think, well, why would people believe that story of Christianity? Christians are not ignorant people. Like, you got a hundred prophecies fulfilled in one man's life? You got a lot of explaining to do about that, right? Like, that's why 2.2 billion people on the planet embrace Christianity, because this is an evidence-based faith. And John lays that out. Like, this happened, here's where it was prophesied. This happened, and there are so many more. I would encourage you to look at the rationality of Christianity, because it's evidence-based faith. Once you see this, Jesus' suffering, his love, his sacrifice, his death, it's something you can't unsee. But John wants you to see one more thing. And the last thing John wants us to see is the transformation of the timid in the burial of Jesus. Two men see this crucifixion and they can't unsee it. Watch what happens. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, who's Joseph of Arimathea? Joseph is actually a member of the Jewish ruling council that condemned Jesus. He's a wealthy man. He's got enough pull to have conversations with the Roman governor. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. It's really important to get. Like, Joseph saw Jesus' miracles in his lifetime and believed. Joseph heard his teaching and believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but because of his position, his job, his wealth, his status, the persecution, he kept it silent. He didn't go public. Any of you ever feel like you're in that dilemma? If people really knew what I believed, if I really spoke up about my Jesus, like, I might lose something. That's what he's doing, and now he comes forward. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus was also a member of the ruling council. He also believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but he kept it silent too. But now they see Jesus suffer, and they come out of the closet. And look at what happens. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Now, myrrh, one of the spices that were brought by the wise men, was very expensive. Like this is a king's ransom, 75 pounds. Jesus is going to be buried like royalty. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Recently on our trip to Israel, we went in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We walked up to the top of the hill, Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. When we went down into the area that was the garden area, we walked into the place where they laid his body in the tomb. I actually had the privilege of kneeling, touching the very spot where Jesus' body had been laid. And there was one thing we got to do this time I've never gotten to do before. They took me back in this little secret place in the back, and they showed me two hewn graves. And they said, that's where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were buried. Now, those are the traditional spots, so we don't have archaeological evidence that that's where they were buried, but they were buried very close to the tomb where Jesus was buried. Why? Because they finally came public with their faith. On 9-11, 
as the country saw those planes fly into those buildings and they erupt into flames, as they watch people jumping from the rooftops rather than burning up, and as they watch first responders running into buildings that would ultimately become their tombs, our country was moved. The US, USO website tells us that over a quarter of a million young men and women enlisted in the military as a direct result of seeing something that was so horrible that they were willing to give years and maybe all of their life to try to stop that kind of injustice in the world. They came out because they couldn't take their eyes off of what they'd seen. It couldn't be unseen. Some of you were those people, and you made that commitment. When a follower of Jesus truly sees what Jesus did for you, can't unsee it. Now, I know in our audience today, there are people from all different places some of you may be looking at the cross of Jesus for the first time. Like this is the first time it ever sunk in that Jesus actually suffered that much. It was out of his love for you that he was suffering. And for you, this is a moment that's changing you. My prayer is that you will give your life to Jesus, that you will embrace him as your Lord and Savior, that today this image will become an icon in your mind and in your life that begins to shape everything about how you live. That you would live into the glory of what God did on your behalf. Some of you may say, well, Tim, there was a time. There was a time when this picture was so crystal clear in my mind. Like I could see it and I was living my life that way, but, but somehow it's gotten blurry to me. It's gotten blurry. A few months ago, I went to the eye doctor and he said, well, the reason why you can't see is because the lenses in your eyes have been damaged by the sun. They are permanently blurry. You have cataracts. And we can fix that by replacing those old lenses with some new ones. And I'm just wondering for some of you, if something shiny out there Maybe your success or a pot of money that you've been chasing or fantastic experiences or maybe there's some kind of a habit in your life that's taken dominance and it's kind of like the sun right now. It's so shining in your eyes that it's actually damaged your ability to see Jesus. And so it's, it's just a blur out there. I would encourage you. It's time to remove whatever that shiny thing is that's got Jesus a blur in your mind. It's time to let that go. It's time to let that go. And you know what it is. Maybe some of you would say, Tim, I wake up in the morning and I think about Jesus. And my heart is overwhelmed with joy and love for what he did for me. And I go to bed at night and I think about Jesus. And I'm reminded again that I have the opportunity to live for him. And my encouragement to you is that you go for it. That you don't sit on the sidelines of life going, well, everybody else is doing life this way, so I have to also but that you allow yourself to be radically transformed, to step into new space, to live out your masterpiece mission, to go for the gold, like to give it all away and not simply be stuck. My prayer for you is when you stand in his presence someday and you look into those eyes, you will hear from him, well done, well done. You understood my love, you understood my sacrifice, and you lived it, come enjoy the happiness of a life well lived. Once you see the cross, you can never unsee it. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, it's my prayer that during Easter, that we would take time 
to sit down in that dusty road outside the gates of Jerusalem and raise our eyes to the top of Golgotha. That we would look into the face of our suffering Savior and we would be willing to sit there until that image of love, that image of pain, and that image of forgiveness becomes who we are as people. Father, grant us the vision that changes everything for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.